So I'm focusing um, some of my slides here on uh, the, the issue of using mathematical models to design um, and predict the results of clinical research uh, studies in humans, um, because that's kind of modeling my sort of transition in my career from just developing mathematical models, which was already difficult enough, to actually testing those models ourselves, uh, designing clinical research studies. And I'll, uh, I'll share some examples of that with you. Um, my disclosures, um, the, I guess the main uh, issue is I have a U.S. patent assigned to the, to the uh, National Institutes of Health that was uh, recently awarded on the, using uh, mathematical models for dynamic control of body weight. So the basic idea um, when I started my lab at the NIH was uh, we have this vast swath of data where people have done controlled feeding experiments, where people have uh, gone, went to metabolic wards and had you know, diets uh, manipulated in terms of the carbohydrate, fat, and protein content, as well as energy content of those diets, uh, changing physical activity. And we know a lot about how the body adapts in terms of energy expenditure, uh, changes in body fat and, and fat-free mass. And it occurred to me that, um, you know, what would be nice is to integrate all of that data in one place by building a sort of mechanistic mathematical model of, of how the body is responding to these changes. And, and we've done that in a, a couple of different papers over the years. Um, and when we were specifically interested in the question of uh, when you manipulate not the calories in the diet, but the composition in terms of carbohydrate, fat, and protein, um, is there any evidence to support the idea that a calorie is not a calorie. Uh, this idea that perhaps if you were to just change the macronutrient distribution of the diet, you could influence metabolism in such a way so as to dramatically change energy expenditure um, and thereby lead to different amounts of weight loss or different amounts of body fat loss. And so we developed a, a model. Here's the a slide showing some of the equations of that model. I thought, you know, I'm not going to belabor this by going into all of the equations, but the point was is that I developed this model and it, it was very interesting because when I went to look for specific data sets that were targeting just cutting one macronutrient at a time or just overfeeding one macronutrient at a time. There turned to be out to be a few overfeeding experiments. Jim Hill, who's sitting in the audience, actually did one overfeeding experiment where they selectively added carbs to the diet or selectively added fat, but nobody had done the reverse, cutting just carbs, keeping fat and protein constant versus cutting um, just fat, keeping carbs and protein constant. And in fact, because of that, um, that lack of data, uh, some folks had suggested that, in fact, in order to lose body fat, you have to cut carbs. If you just cut fat or protein, you couldn't lose fat. Um, and he said, and this is a quote from Gary Taubes in his book, Why We Get Fat, he says, any diet that succeeds does so because the dieter restricts fattening carbohydrates and that those who do not lose fat on a diet do so because what they are not eating, the fattening carbohydrates. In other words, even people who go on a low fat diet and lose weight and body fat, um, the postulate here is that they've done so only because, not because they've cut fat from their diet, but because they've also happened to cut carbs. And if you look at um, the sort of trials that have studied low-fat diets, sure enough, if you compare the baseline to what they did in the low-fat diet, yes, they also cut carbs. So the question was, is it because of the carbs that they cut, or is it because of the calories that they cut, the fat that they cut, et cetera, et cetera? And what was the sort of basis for this rather extraordinary claim that you actually need to cut carbs? Well, the idea was, if you look at the biochemistry and endocrinology of, of body fat uh, regulation at the level of the adipocyte, um, the trafficking of fat, free fatty acids and triglycerides, from the circulation to uh, fat cells uh, is regulated by several enzymes, lipoprotein lipase, hormone-sensitive lipase, and insulin is a primary controller of these uh, enzymes in such a way that if insulin levels are high, the uh, fat in the circulation tends to accumulate in fat tissue and, and be directed away from tissues like muscle and the liver. And so, uh, with, the, with the further observation that the primary thing that seems to drive insulin levels in the blood are dietary carbohydrates. And so this notion then was that, well, if insulin levels are high and that's what's keeping fat inside fat cells and driving obesity, then you can't get rid of it unless you lower insulin levels. And the only way to lower insulin levels, according to this idea, was to decrease carbohydrates. So 
um, we used our model to test that hypothesis and then design a clinical trial that was conducted at the NIH Clinical Center um, to test whether our model's uh, prediction was correct. And so what we did was we designed a pair of uh, random, uh, in random order, uh, isocaloric 30% calorie restricted diets. In one case, all of that calorie restriction coming from carbohydrate cutting. In the other case, all coming from uh, reduced fat diets. That's the RC and the RF, respectively, in this, um, in this uh, curve, in this graph. And uh, we made certain predictions about what would happen to body fat and metabolic fuel utilization and energy expenditure. And uh, one of the predictions here is if you believe that carbohydrate um, insulin idea is that only the reduced carb diet should lead to a reduction of insulin secretion. Um, because that's the primary thing that's driving this, and dietary fat doesn't play a big role in changing insulin secretion. And indeed, that's what we observed. We saw that the reduced carbohydrate diet led to uh, a pretty substantial, more than 20 percent reduction in, in insulin secretion as measured by uh, C-peptide that's excreted in the urine. C-peptide is a molecule co-secreted with insulin and cleared entirely by the kidney. And so by measuring how much is in the urine uh, over a 24-hour period, we get a measure of how much insulin was secreted. And so only the reduced carb diet led to the reduction of insulin secretion. So we've set the conditions up to test this idea. Was insulin secretion reduction required to lose body fat? One of the things that we uh, are, was the primary aim of this study was uh, to actually uh, predict the changes in uh, fuel utilization that were taking place. So what I'm plotting here is the 24-hour respiratory quotient. Um, and a value of 1 means that you're burning entirely carbohydrate. A value of 0.7 means you're burning entirely fat. And what you'll see here, along with the mathematical model predictions, is that only the reduced carbohydrate diet increased fat oxidation so that it goes down within that first week and then sort of plateaus at this lower level. Um, and that the model was doing a reasonably good job of making that prediction um, accurate, accurately. Um, secondly, the, what I thought was perhaps more interesting was that you reduce fat in the diet and nothing happens to the amount of fat that's being burned. The respiratory quotient stays roughly constant, and that was also predicted by the model. Just to show you that I'm not cheating here, here's the experimental protocol, a screenshot from the experimental protocol showing the prediction in advance. Um, so we clearly had zero data, and this, this intervention had never been done, and yet you can see that the 24-hour respiratory quotient was matched matching what we uh, finally observed um, in, these, uh, in these subjects. Um, so what happened with respect to body fat loss? Uh, we, we see that only the reduced carb diet increased fat oxidation, um, and the reduced uh, fat diet did not lead to any change in fat oxidation. So both should lead to negative fat balance, right? In one case, you're keeping the fat intake constant, and you're increasing the amount of fat that you're burning, so therefore you lose body fat. In the other case, you cut the amount of fat coming in, and nothing happened to the amount of fat that you were burning. So you should also lose body fat. And in fact, both groups, or both times, these are the same subjects in random order, they both lost body fat in both periods, but interestingly, it was the reduced fat diet that led to the greater negative fat balance. So in complete opposition to this prediction um, that the insulin is the primary thing driving body fat changes. Um, how did that happen? Well, one of the things that was interesting was that only the reduced carbohydrate diet, again, led to a reduction in energy expenditure. Um, whereas the reduced fat diet led to no significant changes in energy expenditure, both at sleep and in 24-hour period, right? The calorie has to be accounted for in some place, and because we were controlling energy intake, um, those changes, those small changes that we saw in body fat loss in these same people were accounted for by the changes in energy expenditure that we saw. When we uh, published that paper, there was a lot of response from the low-carbohydrate community, in particular someone named Mark Hyman, who's associated with the Cleveland Clinic. He had a book out at the time called Eat Fat, Get Thin, and of course this uh, message of uh, reducing fat in the diet actually leading to slightly more body fat loss was, uh, was a, an offense to him, and so he wrote in, the, uh, in his book that you know, this wasn't a low-carbohydrate diet, it was only 29% carbs, you really have to get down to 10% of calories from carbohydrates to see an effect, and this was only a very short study. Um, if you waited just a little longer, you would have seen people adapt to the, to the low-carbohydrate diet and increase fat oxidation. Of course, I can't deny that such a thing might happen. You know, maybe if we just waited a little bit longer, we would have saw that drop 
in the respiratory quotient further um, over time. And uh, I, can't, I can't say that that couldn't have happened because we didn't do that study. Um, however, we did do another study. Um, we did a two-month isocaloric ketogenic diet study. So after a four-week period of inpatient um, stay uh, with a high-carbohydrate, high-sugar diet, where we matched the energy intake to what people were burning inside metabolic chambers that they spent two days per week, um, we switched them, kept the calories constant, switched them to a 5% carbohydrate diet, 80% fat, kept the protein and calories constant, and asked the question, uh, what happens to energy expenditure when you put people on a very, very low carbohydrate diet but keep calories and protein the same? And uh, so there were various people who had made predictions about what the energy expenditure increase might be. Um, one of them uh, was in this paper called The Thermodynamics of Weight Loss Diets by Eugene Fine and Richard Feynman, who speculated that uh, these very low carbohydrate diets, in, at least in their initial phases, would reach a 400 to 600 calorie per day increase in energy expenditure, and that this is a sizable metabolic advantage for these diets. I, I would agree if this was really what would happen uh, when you kept calories constant and put people on a 5% carb diet if they increased the amount of calories they were burning by 400 to 600 calories a day. That would be a big advantage for weight loss. In fact, that was the original idea behind the Adkins diet. Uh, people often forget that the subtitle of that diet was the high calorie way to stay thin forever. The idea being that if you cut carbs enough, you would increase your energy expenditure to such an extent that you could eat, continue eating a high calorie diet and lose body fat and lose dramatic amounts of body weight. Well, we also made a prediction, again, ahead of time. Um, it was in Wired Magazine, of all places, uh, that, uh, that when we did this study, we, that they should, um, during the low carb, low insulin diet, that they should uh, at most have a tiny effect on the amount of calories that they burn. And this was our prediction. We basically said sleeping energy expenditure should go up slightly below 150 calories a day, uh, total energy expenditure somewhere around 50 calories a day. And we used this prediction to power the study, to basically say how many subjects would we need to have in order to detect an effect size about this magnitude or greater. And in our pre-registered um, uh, 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 protocol, which you can download on the Open Science Framework, we basically said we chose 150 calories per day as the effect size because this is the smallest change in 24-hour energy expenditure that would be physiologically significant. Okay, so what happened? Well, 24-hour um, C-peptide, this is the insulin secretion rate, crashed. It's 50 percent of what it was before. So we're clearly intr introducing a major change in insulin secretion. Um, respiratory quotient, it drops substantially. Uh, and again, these curves here are the mathematical model simulations of these particular uh, subjects um, given their baseline conditions. And what you can see is that in, in the uh, solid curves, uh, the respiratory quotient goes down and it stays down. It doesn't take another nosedive, as you might have hypothesized if some fat adaptation had kicked in later, and the model predicted that. The dash curve is what, what we predict would have happened if we had done nothing. We'd just run uh, a control group along, which we didn't do. That's a weakness of the study. We didn't have a control group that went the entire way, but our mathematical model suggested we wouldn't have seen anything um, in respiratory quotient on that second month um, if we had done that. We have no data to check that. What happened to energy expenditure? Uh, there was a small increase early on in the 24-hour uh, energy expenditure as measured by the chamber. R roughly what you would expect um, based on the model predictions. And what we were in is a slight negative energy balance. That's why these curves are, are going down slightly over time. Um, and uh, you can see that it's, it seems to be petering out over time. Um, sleeping energy expenditure shows a similar pattern. And again, the mathematical model um, uh, uh, predictions are sort of in line with that, although it seems to be depressed a little bit more than the model would predict. Um, interestingly, the rate of body fat loss slowed down on the ketogenic diet which was kind of surprising. Um, and we predicted that it would have a transient slowdown, but um, it, was, it turned out to be a, a significant difference. In other words, we only saw a significant uh, reduction in body fat loss on the, uh, the run-in baseline diet, and it never reached significance afterwards. Um, and the reason that that happened uh, primarily, uh, the initial period is because it takes a couple days for the respiratory quotient to drop to shift to the fat metabolism. But more importantly, 
uh, urinary nitrogen excretion goes up because insulin is playing a role not just in fat tissue and not just in glucose, but also in protein metabolism. And when insulin secretion drops, um, you increase the rate of proteolysis, and that is being used for gluconeogenesis, among other things. And that was in line with the mathematical model uh, predictions, and that offsets fat um, oxidation and fat balance, and therefore you get a transient slowing of the fat loss. So uh, it's, the point here is that you know, we've used models to help design clinical experiments to then run those experiments and then use the data to integrate within the model afterwards as a whole to basically have in one place a way to kind of continuously update how we think about the physiology. And so uh, just to conclude, I uh, just want to hope I've, I've uh, get given, made these points that mathematical models of human metabolism can be used to make experimentally testable predictions, that we've used the models to design controlled feeding studies in humans predict experimental results in advance, and then subsequently quantitatively integrate experimental data along with previous uh, data within the computational models. And that they're never complete. These models are always evolving. Um, in fact, one of the purposes of designing these experiments is to prove them wrong, because the models sort of represent our current physiological understanding of the system. And the idea is that, and the idea of science as a whole, is not to prove yourself right, to pr prove yourself wrong. You're, you hope that you're the one who proves yourself wrong, <laughs> and that you can therefore advance the science forward. In fact, that first study I told you about, um, I was expecting that the respiratory quotient in the re uh, reduced fat diet would go up. I thought that the body would somehow sense that I'd cut a stick of butter out of the diet and it would adapt its fuel selection in such a way to match the diet on the short term, and that did not happen. Um, it mirrored the overfeeding studies, uh, which th that prediction was based on, um, that, that were previously used to build the model. And um, so I was surprised by the model prediction. Uh, so I, it was a win-win situation. If the model turned out to be right, then that's, that's great. I can count it as a win, and I told you the story I told you today. If it turned out to be wrong, I would have potentially discovered something new. And I would have had to look to see how was the body signaling this reduction in, in fat intake, despite insulin secretion, for example, not changing at all. Um, so these models are never complete. And we're continuously uh, making predictions, trying to prove them wrong, and using the, uh, the new data to improve our physiological understanding. So I just want to close by thanking uh, the various <coughs> folks who've participated in this. The people in blue are members of my lab over the years. I really want to thank the, uh, the study subjects who, um, who participated in these, these uh, studies. I want to thank the leadership at the intramural NIH who allowed a physicist to actually lead clinical research experiments, which is a, a surprising, uh, a surprising thing. And I also want to thank the Nutrition Science Initiative who provided partial funding for that ketogenic diet study that was uh, part of Gary Taubes' organization. So thank you very much. Hi, Nate Matuszewski from DSM Nutritional Products. Hi. Um, question about the proteolysis that you observed in the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. I know ketogenic diet is fairly popular among bodybuilders that are looking to quickly get ripped and drop fat. What are the implications for you know, that finding for that population? Yeah, so it's a great question. What, so one of the things that they also do is they increase protein content of their diet. So we did not do that by design, right? So we kept protein clamped the entire way. Yeah. So you could potentially offset some of that negative nitrogen balance by increasing protein intake. 